Hello and welcome to Startup Series, a Global Entrepreneurship Week event where we're talking to entrepreneurship experts from around the country to tell us about the impact that they're having on entrepreneurial ecosystems around the country and around the world. We are very uh, privileged to have John Deary with us today. He is the co-founder and president of the Center for American Entrepreneurship, uh, a startup in and of itself uh, that is helping to advocate and address the needs of startups and entrepreneurs who are typically way too busy building their companies to ever focus on any kind of matters at, at the state, local, or national level in policy. And, uh, and John has started an organization to try to help be a voice for entrepreneurs where they don't typically have a voice. They're such an important uh, contributor to our economy, and yet they don't have uh, the fancy lobbyists to go to bat for them and to work on policies that they know uh, could help them. Uh, and that's where John comes in. So John, thank you so much for joining us during Global Entrepreneurship Week Fort Worth. Thank you so much for joining us on Startup Series. Tell us a little bit about yourself and, uh, and how you ended up uh, founding the Center for American Entrepreneurship. Well, thank you, Cameron, for the invitation. It is really great to be here and thank you for the incredibly important work that you do there. Uh, in my uh, in my birth state of Texas. Uh, and I should also mention that Texas is represented uh, on the board of uh, CAE by Jason Seats um, uh, in Austin uh, and is a wonderful uh, presence on our board and very, very important state to have represented um, uh, in Washington by way of CAE. Um, no, it's really fun to come on because, you know, I do a lot of these. I've done three of these in the last uh, week or 10 days as everybody has moved to Zoom. Um, and I always tell the story uh, that, you know, uh, uh, that you just asked about um, uh, in talking about how I came to entrepreneurship and innovation. And this is 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 the most fun uh, because, of course, it was you. <laughs> it was you who played such an enormous role in my finding my way to this you know, reality about the importance of startups and entrepreneurship. So it's great fun to revisit that. I mean, it was way back, as you recall, it was back in 2011, you know, nine years ago. Can you believe that? Um, but the, the, the quick version of the story is that I was... I'm relatively new to entrepreneurship and innovation. The vast majority of my career uh, I spent in banking and financial policy, started my career at the New York Fed, where I was for 10 years. And then I joined a group called the Financial Services Forum, which was uh, is a financial and economic policy group comprised of the CEOs of the really big financial institutions. Um, uh, and I was there from 2001 through 2017 when I, I left to launch CAE. Um, and it was as the uh, as the country was coming out of the Great Re Recession um, and the financial crisis in 2011, at that point, the economy had been growing for about two years. The Great Recession ended in, in the spring of 2009. The economy had been growing for two years, but very slowly. And unemployment was still north of 9%. Uh, about 14 million Americans were still unemployed. Another 10 were underemployed. Um, and you could feel this real frustration in Washington that, you know, despite having thrown the kitchen sink uh, at the problem policy wise, we just were not getting the kind of traction in terms of economic growth and job creation that everybody, you know, was hoping for. And so I went to the CEOs as, in my role as policy director at the forum and said, you know, we need to do something. Uh, policymakers need some new ideas on economic growth and job creation, how to accelerate those things. Uh, and they said, great, go do it. Uh, and I had no idea <laughs> what what my angle was going to be. And I started doing my homework and eventually came across the research that was new at the time that you're very familiar with, um, uh, done in 2009 and 10 and 11. Uh, by economists at the University of Maryland and ASU and Stanford, uh, uh, other places around the country, and of course, of course, most uh, notably by um, you, you, your former colleagues at the Kauffman Foundation, Bob Lighton, Dane Stangler, Tim Kaine, you know, people like that, showing the following three things um, uh, that were wildly intriguing to me. First, startups are incredibly important from the standpoint at, as a as they are the uh, disproportionately important uh, in terms of contributing uh, innovation uh, to the economy. And that makes sense if you think about it. A, a big reason why somebody starts a new business is they have something new. They have a new product, a new service, a new twist on an old idea. The economics behind that is we know from the great work of American economist uh, Robert Solow, who won the Nobel Prize for this insight in 1987, that uh, innovation is the driving force of gains in productivity, w which in turn drives economic growth. Number two, and relatedly, uh, 
startups, as you recall very well, um, uh, account for most net new job creation in the economy, about on average, historically, 3 million net new jobs a year. Older firms, firms older than five years old in aggregate, actually shed about a million jobs a year as they get better at what they do, as they focus on what they're good at, as they incorporate capital and technology. So another way of saying that is were it not for new businesses, the job space in this country would actually shrink by about a million jobs a year. So from the standpoint of innovation, economic growth and job creation, startups is the bullseye of the action in terms of in terms of the, those those major uh, 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 metrics of well-being uh, for the economy. Third piece of the puzzle and the real head slapper and the reason I reached out to you all at the Kaufman Foundation is, um, as you know, startup rates in the United States have been in decline. Uh, for about four decades. They, they've been in decline in absolute terms in terms of the number of new firms being launched every year since 2006. Uh, that has changed more recently, and perhaps we can talk about that. But for 10 years, uh, startup rates were, uh, had actually fallen in terms of the number of new firms launched every year by about 100,000 a year. So so between the end of the Great Recession and, and 2019, we were down about a million startups. Um, and in relative terms, you know, the proportion of all businesses in the economy that are new, that fraction has been in decline for four decades. And that's the work that Bob Lighton and Ian Hathaway and others have documented. So when I found out all this, frankly, I didn't believe it. Um, and I got in touch with you and you were very gracious and invited me out to the Kaufman Foundation and, and was my my knowledgeable and gracious host. And you really, along with Bob and the other and your other colleagues, really helped me come to understand those three realities. The implication of which is Washington policymakers are digging in the wrong place. They're focused on incumbent firms. They're not focused on where economic growth and job creation actually comes from. Um, and therefore, that's the reason in all likelihood why we were not getting the kind of traction in terms of economic growth and job creation that we hoped for. The next question was, well, why is this decline happening? And when I put that question to you and to Bob and to Dane and others at the Kaufman Foundation, their answer essentially was, you know, we don't know. We're not sure. And that was the question that I and another colleague, as you'll recall, set out to try to, to find answers to. And we did that by conducting roundtables with entrepreneurs all across the country over the course of the summer of 2011, 12 roundtables in 12 states all in all. We talked to about 250 entrepreneurs. I ended up uh, writing a book about that, w w what they told us in terms of what was in their way and took an initial crack at a policy agenda to address those issues that they shared uh, with us. And as I was finishing up that book, I realized there's no organization in Washington, D.C. for me to hand the book to and all the recommendations to. There was no organization in town focused on the reality of how important startups and entrepreneurs are, that they are challenged and in trouble, why that's the case and what to do about it. And so ultimately, after thinking about it for a while, I decided, well, if we need that organization, I might as well start it. Um, so I left the forum in uh, July of 2017 after after uh, working on CAE on the side uh, for two years to stand it up, uh, which is a lot of work just, you know, to organize a new uh, group. Um, and we just marked our third anniversary in July. Um, and it's been a remarkable now 39 months. And we have, um, uh, I think, have managed to put entrepreneurship policy at the very top of the policy agenda in Washington. So it's very exciting. That's fantastic, and and uh, I wish I had a copy of your book in, uh, in here to, to show our audience. Um, tell us a little bit more about the book, because I know you and Courtney Godoldig wrote this. Uh, it's called Where the Jobs Are, I believe, and you really do walk through some of the aspects, not only what you found about job creation, but also about some policy recommendations. Give us a give us a quick headline of some of those policy recommendations, and then and then how have you tried to advance those through CAE? Sure. So, yes, uh, what we do in the in the beginning part of the book is we lay out, uh, uh, we do sort of a, a review of the literature, so much of which came out of Kaufman in terms of the all the things I just talked about, the importance of startups and entrepreneurs to innovation, economic growth, job creation. We sort of lay all that out in the first part of the book. Then we talk about um, our journey around the United States, asking entrepreneurs a very simple question, what's in your way? Um, and what was remarkable about that experience is that 
as we traveled around the country in startup communities, you know, we were talking earlier about Ian Hathaway and Brad Feld's uh, new book, Start the, uh, the Startup Community Way. Startup communities around the United States, and this is, is one thing that they emphasize in the book, are all very different. Um, and so what we expected when we set out that we would hear different things in different startup communities because the cities that we went to, Boston, Cambridge is really different than Austin, Texas, et cetera, et cetera. And the remarkable thing was, while it was true that we heard problems and issues talked about in in different ways or through a different regional lens, if you will, certain problems emphasized over others, we began to realize that we were hear hearing essentially the same issues, the same obstacles and challenges everywhere we went. And it was things like there are problems with the commercialization of federally funded uh, innovation in terms of getting the, these innovations into businesses or out into the economy through new businesses. We have problems finding enough people in terms of staff and employees that have the skills that we need. Uh, we can't address that problem by attracting a sufficient amount of foreign born talent because we can't keep these folks in the country. They keep having uh, visa problems. Um, all kinds of issues pertaining to access to capital, either problems with banks or problems with angel capital, problems with attracting venture capital. Um, lots and lots of complaints about uh, the impact and the distractions of regulatory burden, complexity and uncertainty. And then a lot of issues uh, around uh, tax burden, complexity and uncertainty, v uh, very similar. It's principally a distraction issue. And then there were some other um, sort of one-off types of issues, many of which have gotten worse, like you know, the impact of student debt on entrepreneurship and the ability of startups and uh, startup employers, entrepreneurs to find talent who can go to a startup, as you were talking about early, uh, earlier, probably making, at least initially, a lower salary. That can be very hard if you're, if you're having to service you know, a, a student debt bourbon, burden. Um, and other issues, but but the major themes that we heard, we subsequently in the book and 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 the way we've structured CEA's policy agenda, because it's a very good and easily understandable way to, uh, to present it to policymakers, is we ask a very simple question: What do entrepreneurs need to thrive? They need great new ideas. They need the talent and the capital to pursue those ideas with as few unnecessary or stupid distractions as possible. So in the new ideas category, you have things like a research and development policy, tech transfer and commercialization issues of the sort that I talked about. In the talent category, you've got uh, uh, education uh, reform, workforce uh, readiness, uh, immigration uh, reform policies, everything having to do with talent, access to skilled talent. Um, capital, access to capital, there's all kinds of issues um, in terms of access to bank capital, angel capital, venture capital, uh, government provided capital. Um, and then of course, uh, there's lots of challenges or issues in the regulatory and tax uh, lanes. And so that's how we have divided up our agenda. We're active on in all of those issue areas, but, but of course we, part of our job is to monitor by way of the relationships that we've built and cultivated with key members of Congress, key committees, key staff, what they're most interested in at any particular time. And then we folk, you know, when we sense interest in a particular topic, that's an important part of our policy agenda. That's where we shift our attention. So even though we're active on a very wide range of issues, if you go to our website, you'll find all of them at any particular time, we might be, mo you know, mo more or most active on say access to capital or immigration policy or tax policy. Um, um, and that's how we do our job. That's great. And, and I think the jobs are so critical because my experience has always been that policymakers think in terms of jobs, right? They, they think in terms of how many jobs we lost in a recession, how many we created, you know, you, you get that, uh, those, those reports every, at the end of every month, you know, this is how the economy's doing. Um, but entrepreneurs and, and others in the community, they just think in terms of starting companies, right? They're not thinking about it in terms of jobs. They're thinking about it in terms of dollars and investments and customers and things like that. How do you, how do you kind of put those two worlds together? And I'm asking with a very specific, in a very specific context, which is we just released a jobs report study in Tarrant County, uh, Fort Worth and Tarrant County, that showed that firms zero to one years old, so the startupest of all startups, 
created about 25,000 jobs a year and have been doing that over the last six years. So how do you kind of square that circle of the impact of job creation that's happening uh, really without you know, a whole lot of government assistance and then, and then how the policymakers understand what that is in terms of jobs? Yeah, no, you're exactly right. The policymakers are really super focused on job creation as, as you know, you might call it the most, um, uh, you know, politically important economic uh, metric of well-being. Uh, certainly economic growth is important as well, but uh, economic growth has implications for things like opportunity, job creation, rising wages, et cetera. Jobs is really the thing that uh, uh, policymakers are most focused on. James Baker, you know, famously said, jobs, 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 you know, when it comes to, you know, presidential elections. Um, uh, it's true that that um, uh, entrepreneurs are not focused, you know, in a in a uh, in an intentional, you know, sort of uh, first tier of things that they're concerned about sense, you know, how many jobs that they're creating, but that doesn't matter. Our job is to point out to policymakers, uh, is to, is to make the case to them how important startups and entrepreneurs are to things that they care about and why they should focus on this aspect of our economy. Part of the reason why we started CA, as I said uh, before, is there was nobody in Washington at the time that we launched educating and engaging policymakers on this reality. So you have big business and existing small businesses very well represented in Washington, incumbents, you know, big and small, who are constantly talking to policymakers about how important they are and their unique needs. Um, and so it's not a surprise that we have an economic and political architecture in this country uh, that is tipped very much in favor of incumbents and exi you know, existing uh, players on the field. Nobody was advocating on behalf of the unique importance and, and unique needs of startups. And that's what we stepped into. Um, uh, I think we've made a tremendous amount of progress um, in just three years in educating policymakers about how important this aspect of the economy is. And one of the most concrete examples um, of both the extent to which entrepreneurship was not on the radar screen at all in 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 Washington uh, uh, when we launched, and one of the things that we've done to fix that is there had never been an entrepreneurship caucus in either chamber of Congress, and, and for those of, uh, folks who are listening who who are not familiar with caucuses, caucuses are best thought of as sort of a club uh, within Congress, uh, either the House or the Senate. There are informal, you know, sort of arrangement or, or or group of members of Congress interested in a particular topic. It gives them the opportunity to learn about the topic. It gives them the opportunity to hold events, to hold um, roundtables, uh, uh, to have speakers. Um, and most importantly, it's, it's sort of a go-to group of members of Congress as co-sponsors uh, for legislation having something to do with that particular topic. And there are hundreds and hundreds of caucuses uh, in Congress for everything under the sun. Um, two of my favorite examples in that regard is there is a river trade caucus. Uh, and most amusingly, there is a unexploded ordinance caucus in the Congress. <laughs> wow, but entrepreneurship was missing. Entrepreneurship was, I mean, was the glaring oversight that there had never wow. been an entrepreneurship caucus. Well, there is now. Um, and that happened because of CAE. Uh, uh, we, we helped establish the Senate Entrepreneurship Caucus in March of last year. Amy Klobuchar is the Democratic co-chair. Tim Scott is the Republican co-chair. There are about 15 or 16 senators in that caucus. And then in October, we established the House Entrepreneurship Caucus with six co-chairs because the House is much bigger. Uh, and those caucuses have already uh, proven productive. Uh, specific pieces of legislation, in fact, several of them have already come out of those caucuses. And so we're very, very pleased that we've corrected um, that omission. And now that we have this very important part of the policy making uh, machinery on the Hill, an entrepreneurship caucus in both chambers, we are very hopeful that we can use this machinery to you know, successfully push uh, a pro entrepreneurship, pro innovation agenda uh, in ways that we, you know, that, that uh, the entrepreneurship and innovation community could only dream about before. Well, and what I what I love about that, John, is that that's a very bipartisan way of thinking about it, right? Entrepreneurship is not a right issue or a left issue. Every politician wants more jobs. Every politician wants more economic growth for their district, their state. 
and it's not a red or a blue issue, right? Entrepreneurship is just a good thing, and, and we in the United States happen to be really good at it. But what do you see as some of those issues that CEA is gonna tackle in the next few years? What are some of those things that, those, those pieces of legislation that have already been drafted that, uh, that that caucus and that the CEA is gonna be advancing over the next few years? So uh, there are there are three specific uh, pieces of legislation that were have been introduced in recent months, uh, having to do both with entrepreneurship and I think I think the you know the the backdrop situation here that I think has really shown a very bright spotlight on entrepreneurship is COVID and the and the impact the damage that COVID has done uh, to the economy both in terms of economic growth, uh, job creation and as a result economic security opportunity. Uh, wages, et cetera. We've got to get this economy moving as fast as possible. Of course, you know, the first step in that regard is we got to get control of COVID um, and very much hoping uh, that we will in 2021. Um, but but as part of that, you know, uh, both simultaneously and, and, and afterward, uh, if, if you're aware of how important startups and entrepreneurs are to economic growth and job creation, then the post-COVID economic policy agenda has got to be focused there. Um, and so um, there are three bills th that have been introduced in recent um, uh, months that uh, have to do principally with access to capital and, 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 and making sure that um, startups are not dying on the vine um, in the in the midst of COVID because they can't get access to capital or their capital sources are drying up. So uh, um, and and then and then the, the the first of these bills I'm going to talk about is also very important from the standpoint of uh, of, of increasing or augmenting the government's uh, commitment to research innovation, um, and then also entrepreneurship. And that bill is called the Endless Frontier Act. That that bill was introduced in May by Senator Schumer, uh, the minority leader in the Senate uh, on the Democratic side, Todd Young from Indiana on the Republican side. And what the Endless Frontier Act would do would greatly augment the country's commitment and investing in research and development, and would also establish uh, about a dozen regional uh, innovation centers around the country. And so you have this effort to try to diversify uh, the innovation activities and capacity of the country. Of course, innovation investment is great, but but the way that innovation gets out into the economy and society is by is through commercialization, but by way of new businesses. Um, and so there are some entrepreneurship aspects of the Endless Frontier Act, but more importantly, uh, a bill that I mentioned that the uh, two caucuses have already been ver uh, very productive in introducing uh, uh, legislation. One uh, bill that was introduced um, uh, by Amy Klobuchar and, and a number of other senators, Tim Kaine from Virginia, uh, Chris Coons from Delaware, Angus Young of, of Maine, but what, what was led principally by uh, Amy Klobuchar is called the New Business Preservation Act. Uh, and what that would do is try to incentivize a diversification of venture capital investment in promising young companies around the country, particularly outside of the major uh, venture capital centers in the country. As you might know, 80 to 85 percent of venture capital is in either Silicon Valley, uh, New York or Boston. Uh, and that leaves the rest of the 47 states of the country to, to share 15 percent of the venture capital. Um, Nobody wants to, you know, a heavy handed government uh, intervention there, but but we do think it's government's role to, to try to create more attractive investment circumstances to incentivize venture capitalists to get out of those three major ve uh, venture capital centers and look at investment opportunities and promising young companies in places like Texas and places like Indiana in heartland states. And that's what the new Business Preservation Act would do. So it's a really interesting, you know, we tend to think of those two bills as a great one two punch of innovation and then financing of the commercialization of that innovation. Then there's another bill uh, called the Ignite American Innovation Act that is designed to try to get capital to startups um, who might not be eligible for assistance like PPP or other aspects of government assistance in the midst of COVID. And what th this would do is it would amend the tax code uh, in a way to help startups that have tax assets of value on their balance sheets, principally uh, net operating losses, because startups t tend to lose a lot of money in their initial years and they don't have revenue uh, in, until year five, six, seven, or whatever. So they don't have an income tax liability against which to apply their net operating losses. 
another example is the research and development tax credits. You need an income tax uh, liability. You, you need to owe income tax in order to be able to take advantage of those credits. Uh, startups, uh, because they don't have revenue, oftentimes don't have an income tax uh, liability. And so these tax assets that have value are sort of trapped on their balance sheet. And so what this bill would do ingeniously, I think, and Dean Phillips of Minnesota is the is the Democratic co-sponsor, uh, uh, Jackie uh, Walorski, a Republican from Indiana is the Republican co-sponsor. It would allow startups to, 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 to sort of cash in, even if they're pre-revenue, to cash in those assets as a way of getting badly needed capital uh, to startups amid the COVID crisis. So in the, in the immediate months of 2021, as we, as everybody's focused on, on getting control of COVID and getting the economic recovery going, um, those are the three pieces of legislation that we'll be focused on. Once we're hopefully toward the tail end of the pandemic and things begin to normalize, we will return to other aspects of our agenda like immigration reform, education re reform, um, tech transfer and commercialization, uh, regulatory reform, other aspects of tax reform. Uh, but the immediate you know, sort of crisis is how do we get badly needed capital to start up so that they survive and can lead the post-COVID uh, economic recovery. Well, John Deary, thank you so much for joining me on this uh, episode of Startup Series. Fascinating stuff. Great to hear the update from DC, despite being in these super uncertain times uh, with uh, just an election that is still undecided. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you'd like to learn more about John or about the Center for American Entrepreneurship, you can Google them or you can go to, John, what's the website? Uh, startupsusa.org and follow startups us on USA Twitter too. Dot, okay, startupsusa.org is the website. And yes, follow them on Twitter. I know that I certainly do. And they always have a great little factoids and, uh, and fun policy facts. So John, thanks so much for joining us and uh, happy Global Entrepreneurship Week.